It's Meet the Writers from the Barnes & Noble studio on BN.com. I'm Steve Bertrand. Kathy Reichs burst onto the book scene in 1997 with her book, Deja Dead. She'd been on the anthropological scene for some time before that. And since then, she's been a fixture in both. She joins us now. Kathy, welcome. Thank you. There was a piece on you in 1997 when you were first starting out. And the writer just talked about how nice you were and said, <laughs> I could see the, the author or the, or the writer of the piece said, I could see the fame train running right over her. Really? So I'm wondering how you've changed as a writer or personality since then. Gosh, I'm not sure. I hope I've improved as a writer. Yeah. When I read some of the phrases in my first book, Deja Dead, some of the metaphors that I really pushed, um, I hope I've improved since then. I don't think personality-wise I've changed You're just very as nice as ever. <laughs> of course. Just as much of a pushover <laughs> as ever. That's it. Though, oh, that gentleman probably never had to work with me, though, or he wouldn't uh, think I was a pushover. But things started quickly for you. Very quickly. Yes. And were they ever overwhelming? I don't think so. I'm used to multitasking. I taught university and, and, and worked as a consultant in forensics first. And so then I moved into forensics and the literary world. And then I moved into the world of literature and television. So I'm, I'm pretty energetic, I you're guess. Always I'm moving. always doing more and than one you're thing. You're still working in North Carolina and Quebec as well. I'm mostly working in Quebec. I still do all of the casework for the Laboratoire de Sciences Judiciaires de Médecine Légale in Montreal. Um, I do a few select cases in the United States now. I, I pick and choose the cases that appeal to me for some issue. So tell me how in the mid-'90s this idea of writing fiction came to you. I had a colleague at university where I was teaching that had written some um, straight to paperback mass market books, mm -hmm. and she made a, a little income on the side. And I had three kids who were getting older and talking about going to private universities and on a university professor's salary that wasn't looking real good. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll give it a shot. I had just worked on a serial murder case. Um, I had just made full professor. So I had a story idea. I had the freedom to do what I wanted to do, so I decided to try fiction. Was it an economic idea more than an itch to write? It was both. Yeah. It was really both. It was. I've always. I written. don't think you could probably do it just for economics. I I don't think you could do it well. You have to have the experience. You have to have a story to tell. Mm -hmm. I think, and you have to have the the passion and maybe just the discipline to put it on paper. The serial case you're talking about was this Archambault character? That's correct, yeah. A real-life murderer. Yes, he was. And from him you wrote Deja Dead. Based on his story, um, it involved dismemberment and saw mark analysis in bone. And I change all of... Each of my books is based on some case I've worked on or some experience I've had. Mm -hmm. And then I change all of the details, all the names and dates and places. And but the, the kernel comes from... Real events in one way or another. Exactly. The kernel, and often what I'll do is I'll have more than one storyline going. Mm -hmm. So I may have pulled from two different cases or two different experiences. And so here we are with 206 bones. Right. And I don't know if you want to give up the details of, of the case behind that, but it came from a real-life event as well. It came from a couple of cases. Um, one was a woman who went to Quebec from Chicago and died in Quebec, and her remains were found sometime later. So it was a skeletal case. So it came to me. Um, the other involved the death of a policeman back in the 1960s. And uh, he was, uh, the coroner ruled he died of a shotgun uh, suicide to the chest. And the family always thought he'd been shot in the back. He'd been murdered. So we exhumed him and looked at the defect in his breastbone and resolved that situation. So there are thriller sorts of stories, suspense stories in these books. But you also take on issues as well, right? And in this one, we're looking at cheap science in one way or another. Yeah, we're looking at either cheap science or just flat-out bad science. Do we have incompetent forensic? Forensic science all of a sudden is hot. So a lot of people are hanging out their shingles now. I have a degree in chemistry, so, oh, I'm going to be a forensic chemist or I'm going to be a forensic psychologist. So it's quite an issue right now. How do you determine who is a legitimate expert? So that's a theme in this book. And those of us who don't know much about the science, I think, often think that just about any case can be solved scientifically. Right, the CSI is, effect. Is that the case or not the case? <laughs> it's not the case. You don't always find that one you know, eyelash in an, an acre of, of corn. When the or music swells up behind <laughs> Exactly. You, we you? have it. We <laughs> finally found it. Yeah, no, that's not always the case. And, and DNA is not always even relevant in many cases. I'm interested in what you think about this country's relationship with science. Because I know in a previous book you, you mentioned you wrote about stem cell research as well. 
So as a scientist, observing this country as a writer as well, do we get it when it comes to science? I think we're getting it better now. All yeah. of a sudden, we're fascinated with science. You know, for years, nobody paid any attention to forensic science. You know, now it's hot, which is a good thing because kids are getting interested. Kids are getting excited about science. They see the relevance of why they have to sit through chemistry and biology. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a good thing. But I do think we have an unrealistic attitude towards the power of... is a very powerful tool in forensics or any ever, other endeavor, but... We have a bit of an unrealistic expectation of it. That's an interesting answer because I thought you might say that we don't put enough trust or we're too skeptical of science, but you're saying maybe that we think it can do more than it probably can. I think that's one of the myths that um, television and a lot of popular culture novels and things do perpetrate that idea. I want to talk about your forensic work as well. Uh, you, you worked on the World Trade Center bombing. I, not on the bombings, but no. <laughs> but I helped recover and identify victims yeah. after. What was that like? That's probably the single hardest thing I've ever had to work on. It was both physically and psychologically very, very exhausting. Do those things stay with you? Do the working on victims and things, does that sort of haunt you? Some more so than others. Um, we were briefed in when we arrived to work at Ground Zero. I went there with DMORT, which is the National Disaster Mortuary Operational Response Teams. And we were told you might experience this and that and sleeplessness and flashbacks. And I thought, not me. I'm, I'm I've been tough. here, done that. But I did. Yeah. yeah, I actually did experience some of those. And you can't really explain it. I've heard soldiers say this who've come back from, from war. You can't really explain it to someone else who hasn't been there. Is it gone now or is it still with you? Yeah. No, it's, it's gone I now. mean, every now and then something will, you know, will bring it back. But uh, I don't think it's had any lasting psychological impact. Temperance Brennan finds herself in physical danger from time to time. Have you ever found yourself in physical danger? Oh, not really. I've had some threats. Um, I've but, had some threats. <laughs> I've had Throws some it away. threats. There is a gentleman on death row who was less than pleased with my testimony. Um, I think our biggest threat, if I were afraid of one thing in my line of work, our biggest threat is microbes. You know, if something's going to get you, it's going to be the microorganisms that you might pick up. That worries Doing me. your job. Yeah, that worries me more than, you know, some nut with a gun. Uh, you write Temperance Brennan, and it's based on you, obviously, in, in many ways. And then there's this television show, Bones, right. with the same character, right. but a, di a different age. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so I'm wondering, as the sort of the inspiration for those two women, what's it like to watch or read them at different ages of their lives? I really like the fact that TV Tempe, as I think of her, is different from book Tempe because she's younger. It's a prequel. It's an earlier point in her life. And when I sit down to write a Temperance Brennan novel, I'm not impacted by that because I'm writing about quite a different mm -hmm. um, person. She's an older woman and more sophisticated, more polished, um, in different places, having experienced different things. But do you see TV Tempe growing into book Tempe? Well, most TV shows have a lifespan of six or seven seasons. So we'll be going into our fifth season this year. And uh, pretty much the most you can expect after that is one or more Years. So. But I wonder when you're writing the yeah. books if you might be informed by the character in the TV, like this is where she came from, yes or no? They've given her on TV some backstory that's very different from the backstory I've given Temperance in the mm. books, and readers and viewers just have to deal with that. So, <laughs> book, so book Temperance is more like you yes. than TV Tempe. Yes. They share a sense of humor. She, Book Tempe has much more of a sense of humor, I think, and she shares that with me mm -hmm. more than the TV Tempe. So how do you relax? Or when do you relax? Well, I relax. I just uh, do whatever anybody does. I'm trying to learn to play golf, which is That's not relaxing really not very yeah, relaxing no. at all. <laughs> it's very works. stressful. Yeah, and, you know, I play tennis or um, go to the beach Nothing particularly special. You do, so it seems to me that you probably don't find yourself in need of relaxation. Oh, of course I do. You do? Yeah. When you come home from a long day at the lab, you want to just turn on some mindless TV or read a good book or just go out to dinner or do what everybody does. You know? And not to criticize the TV show, but you're providing both in a way. A television well, show and a yeah, good book. Hopefully. Hopefully. Not I too like bad. watching Bones. Often that's what I turn on. Kathy Reichs, it was nice to talk to you. Thank you. You too. I'm Steve Bertrand. This is Meet the Writers from the Barnes & Noble studio on BN.com.